Okay, so let's continue. So we were talking about uh, Lagrangians for vector superfields, and uh, <coughs> and uh, so let me just remind you where we were. Vector superfields. We had the case of a super QED. in which the Lagrangian was just a phi dagger <coughs> e to the minus qv times phi and the q is just plus d term plus w phi f term plus a constant tau that we can always absorb in the Lagrangian, and that is W alpha So we had, this was our Lagrangian for a super QED. And then, uh, well, what, what is useful after that is, is, is to write the Lagrangian in terms of components. So that's as we did for the case of just uh, cattle superfields. So, <clears throat> so let's do that in components. Phi dagger into the QV phi. <coughs> D term. I'm sorry, I forgot one piece. Which was the phi area plus term. Remember that I mentioned at the end. Okay. So in components, this uh, first part will be f times f star <coughs> plus d mu phi, d mu phi star. <coughs> plus i psi bar sigma mu bar mu mu psi plus q d mu oh, better use the other line so plus let me just write it here it will be long so I better start writing here q d mu I bar sigma bar mu psi plus i over two phi star mu phi <coughs> minus i over two phi d mu phi star plus i over root two q factor of phi lambda bar. Psi bar minus phi star lambda psi plus one half. Sorry about this. It's a bit long. Q over two d plus mu d mu phi square. Where to to get? To this uh, expression, notice that we have an exponential of uh, v. So an exponential of a superfield looks completely hopeless because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's <laughs> a superfield is complicated, so the exponential is. But for doing this, what I, I'm doing is I'm using the Wesumino gauge. 
And for the Wessel minimal gauge, remember that the v square was very simple and v cube was zero. So the exponential then stops at the, at the v square. So for this, I have used, well, So we have used the Wessel minimal gauge. In which uh, v to the n greater than, than three was uh, greater or equal than three was zero. So then the exponential is very easily controlled, and that's that, that is the, the power of the Wessel-Minot gauge <coughs> that we can write something that makes sense. Uh, notice that this Lagrangian is precisely what we expected for for QED. I could have written it even in a shorter way, but I wanted to be explicit. So notice we have the standard kinetic term for the scalar field, kinetic term for the fermion field, but it, this is a gauge theory, so it has to come out in terms of covariant derivatives. And the covariant derivatives actually come here. I could have written just covariant derivative of phi and covariant derivative of psi, because notice that we have the coupling of V sigma psi. This will be the thing that will enter into the covariant derivative. And also the, the term V mu d mu phi that will enter into here. Okay, and the same for, well, for this one. So all this term, all what this term is doing is just completing these two terms as covariant derivatives. Okay. The muse can be completed. as dimius from the term okay so <clears throat> and from this term also okay, this is v mu v mu is also part of the covariant derivative so <clears throat> essentially we have the whole Lagrangian can be written in a simple way, just f, f, da, f, f star, covariant derivatives of phi, covariant derivatives of psi, and then plus the coupling of phi, and, uh, phi lambda and psi, which are kind of a <coughs> copies of a scalar to the f corresponding fermion and Gagino. This is the Gagino, how the Gagino couples to the chiral components of the chiral superfield, and, and the D term. Okay, so those are the 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 points I wanted to make clear. So we have, <coughs> it's nice that this way of covariantizing in a supersymmetric way gives you in components the standard covariantization of, of, the, of, the, of the derivatives in the component Lagrangian. It had to be because both are ways to impose the, the Lagrangian to be gauge invariant. <coughs> okay. Good. Uh, that was the part for phi dagger phi, but I told you that, the, that the, but it has other, these other two, two parts. I will skip this for the, for the moment because W of phi, well, let me just do it. W of phi, that will be equal to zero if only one carrier superfield. Because if it is charged, it will not be invariant on the aggregation transformations. <clears throat> or well, if it be a constant, but the constant is irrelevant. Uh, and if we, if we have so several of them, then uh, <clears throat> then it will not be zero because then you can have combinations which are chargeless. Sorry? Yeah? A question? 
No question. Okay, so this, and, uh, in any case, this will not give us anything new from what we had before, because here the superpotential only depends on the chiral superfields and not on the vector superfields. So whatever we had before applies <coughs> here, except that now we have to impose that the superpotential has to be invariant under the corresponding gauge transformation. Okay, so we took W. Now let's see what happened to this field strain superfield. That equals one half d squared, where I remember d is the is the d term of the vector superfield minus one quarter f mu nu f mu nu. And let me just write this as uh, the whole thing tau. Then so here I can write the real part of tau. No, it is zero because imagine phi has to be invariant on the on the transformation on the gauge transformation. So any power of phi, I'm sorry, phi, sorry, phi is not invariant. Phi transform on the gauge transformation. So any power of phi will transform. The only way to get something invariant is to multiply phi by by another um, by another superfield. Sorry, I, I changed my mind. I better write this without the top because person. Sorry about that. So otherwise, it would be more complicated. Plus uh, lambda sigma mu d mu lambda. Sorry? Any power. Take phi and transform as, as, as with a phase, or so. then any power of phi will transform with another phase, but they are not, never invariant. Because remember, the important thing on the superpotential is that it's holomorphic. You cannot have phi and phi bar together. So you cannot, if phi transforms on the, uh, the gauge transformation, you cannot make it into an invariant uh, um, object. Uh, imagine just have phi transform e to, uh, as a phase. Phi squared transforms e to the 2i times the phase. And phi to the n transforms e to the 2i n times the phase. And so it, it is not invariant. So what you need to have w to be invariant. So the, the whole Lagrangian has to be invariant. And uh, so the only way... But you said you wanted there, it was only one phi. If there's only one phi, so the only thing that is invariant is zero, or constant. Yes. Then you have several phi's, you can combine them to get zero charge. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't clear on this. This is since W has to be Invariant. Yes, that, that's the. <clears throat> okay, and the last term I was writing here was F mu nu, F mu nu dual, where F mu nu. F mu nu, where F mu nu dual equals epsilon mu nu rho sigma F rho sigma is the dual of the corresponding uh, field strength. Okay, so here, as I promised before, you can recognize. This term, which is the the the, um, the Maxwell term, so it's the kinetic term for the gauge fields, and that that's precisely the reason why we were dealing with this object, that because W alpha had f mu nu as one of its components, so W W, w alpha W alpha was a, a renormalizable coupling that precisely has as a, a part of the of its f term gives you the. Um, the f mu f mu and uh, the other term we have here this is a kinetic term for the gauginos the gauginos also which are the partners of the, of the gauge bosses they need a kinetic term and they get it 
from this term, from W alpha, W alpha. This term is, is a part of, the, of D, and now D will be an auxiliary field, as I promised, and look that it's behaving as that, because D only appears here as quadratic, and uh, in here, it appears only D times something. Uh, so it doesn't have any kinetic term, it doesn't have a propagator. So D, again, will be an auxiliary field in the same way that F was an auxiliary field for the chiral superfield. And the last term is this one, F mu nu, F mu nu dual. Probably you're not very familiar with this type of terms, but this is a, a, a term that, uh, uh, so it's, if you include the, Einstein, the Maxwell term in, the, in your action, you have to include this one because they have the same order. Uh, uh, <coughs> but however, since you have F mu nu, F mu nu dual, you can prove that this term is a total derivative. So a total derivative usually is not important in, in when you do perturbation theory. However, for QCD and uh, 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 in, when you deal about non perturbative physics, physics, this will be very important. And when you talk about instantons and so on, this will be very important. So at the moment, this is just a total derivative. But it's nice that the whole thing just comes naturally from the, from the term W alpha, W alpha. Plus complex conjugate, of course. Com question? Yes? Um, can you give us an expression for the trace of a product of four matrices? Sigma mu, uh, sigma bar nu, sigma lambda, sigma bar next index? Because uh, the trace is occurring in, uh, when trying to verify uh, this, and yes, uh, how to handle that. Okay, well, uh, from, not from the top of my head now, but, but uh, 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 we, we can discuss it later. Yes, uh, with some, some technical things. And just in, you know, the sigmas are, 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 we know what they are, so we know the products, so we you know the, the anti-commutators and so on. So we, with that, that can be dealt with, yes. Yes, but it's a very technical thing at the moment. Yeah. Question, yes? Um, there's no term only if. Oh, that's a good question. What is it, why is it that we don't have f tilde mu nu times f tilde mu nu? Good. Um, because that is, is essentially the same as this one. So multiply this times epsilon, then you use the product of epsilon, then you have f, f, f. Yeah. Yes. Good point. Yes. <clears throat> yes. OK, so we have considered all the terms except for the very last one, which is uh, here, the, the, um, the Fagelopoulos term, and of course, the Fagelopoulos, the D term of this is, for this you require a, a lot of uh, calculations, of course, <coughs> and that is giving you, slightly, <laughs> so there's nothing. It's just the D term of V, which is D. OK, so we are done. And uh, so what is it what we did when we had this, the whole, so the whole Lagrangian will be the sum of, 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 of this term plus that term plus this term. And uh, uh, what is it that we did in the case of the, of the chiral superfield Lagrangian is that out of the whole Lagrangian, we extracted the, the part that depended only on the auxiliary field. And then we eliminated the auxiliary field from its field equations and then plug it back. Okay? We're going to do exactly the same here. So now, <coughs> uh, notice that D is an auxiliary field and doesn't have propagator, so we can eliminate it. And, uh, and uh, each term of the Lagrangian contributes to, to D. This is linear, this is quadratic, and this is linear. So again, the Lagrangian for, for the auxiliary field will be quadratic. The corresponding path integral will be a Gaussian, and it can be done Exactly. So, so so L D is a Q. 
q over 2 plus 1 half d square. times d. And so the field equation <coughs> just vary this with respect to d. So that will tell you Excuse me? Should there be a mod pi squared in the Q of that? So should it be Q over 2 times P oh. times mod pi Thank you very much. This one. Yes, thank you. It's because of uh, this term. Yes, thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. So <coughs> this tells you that, that uh, D equals to minus psi minus q over 2 times phi square. And then substitute this back. So what we get is the sa it's similar to what we, we had uh, for the F term, is that we plug into here. <coughs> so we'll get, this will be one half d square, given that, and this one will give you another contribution. So at the end, this will give us a one half psi plus one half q phi square. And what uh, will this be? This will be a term that will depend on the scalar component of the, of the chiral superfield and not on, on its derivatives, so that is a part of the potential for the field phi. Okay. So. Okay, so actually, when you do this, you will get a minus sign. So, a minus acting uh, minus that in the Lagrangian that will give you plus that in the potential. Okay, so that means that we can have a total scalar potential in general. In general. Uh, total scalar potential and that I will write it like this just to not confuse this V with the V of the vector superfield that again is unfortunate that they are both called V and this will be a V coming from the F term part of the potential plus V coming from the D part of the potential. And this will be equal to what we had here was DW D phi square. <coughs> and what we have here is this piece, this one. And again, notice, notice that uh, similar to the only F term piece, it is the, it, this is the sum of two positive terms. So this is actually semi-positive definite. So this is a, a curious property that we will see is not by chance. So in the sense that the energy in, in global supersymmetric theories is positive. 
So you can see that the potential is the sum of two positive terms. Yes? Yeah. If you have more than one, exactly. That's when you have more than one field. So this will be sum of the defines, and, and this is the sum of the charges so times defines. So probably I should, I should write it like this. If you want to have the, the general case. OK, so th this, this is a, a very important uh, uh, result, and it's one of the things that we, we will be using a lot, is the scalar potential. Because the scalar potential, remember, that defines the, the vacuum of your theory. You have to, given a potential, you have to, exp uh, you have, given a theory with a potential, you have always to look at the minimum of the potential that will give you the configuration of minimum energy. And from that, you perturb around that. So it's, it's always very important to know what the potential is, and in this case, we know it, and we have a lot of information, in particular, that it is positive semi-definite. OK, so <clears throat> that's, this is it. So this, this essentially finishes uh, the, the, the super QED part. So we have the whole Lagrangian, kinetic terms, and uh, couplings of uh, fermions to bosons. And, and the scalar potential. So that's, that's the sense of the whole thing, and, and, and it comes out as uh, supersymmetric in a supersymmetric matter. Uh, so before moving to another uh, chapter, I would like to make uh, two comments. One is that uh, this Lagrangian that I have I wrote for you here as a D term, as an F term, can be written. Uh, you can write that as a, as an integral on superspace. And that, that is nice because we know that, for, for instance, the, the action in, well, it's generally the integral of, of, of over space time of the, of, of, of the Lagrangian. And uh, here it would be nice to see if we can, have, we can write this as an integral also on the theta components. And this can be done easily. So the action as a super space integral. <coughs> Well, as, as again, uh, without supersymmetry, we know that the action is the integral of the Lagrangian over space time. And for SUSI, we have to, to see if we can actually use that uh, information to write it in terms of an um, of integral over the whole superspace. <coughs> And for that, to record the following is that d2 theta, theta, theta equals to 1, and uh, d4 theta, 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 theta bar, theta bar equals to 1. And essentially, any other combination will be zero, because remember that the integral of, the, of d theta itself was zero. It's only when you have saturated and you get it uh, to be uh, one in this case. So so the, uh, <coughs> that means that if we write 
if we write the Lagrangian like uh, the d term of a killer potential plus um, the f term of a superpotential plus uh, the f term of a w alpha w alpha <clears throat> you add it like this notice that the d term is precisely the term that has theta 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 bar theta bar and the f term is the term that has theta theta and it's precisely the two things that we have over there so we can write this like uh, the integral over d4 theta of k plus integral of d2 theta of w because this is an f term this has only theta theta um, plus, con plus conjugate plus integral of w alpha w alpha against uh, sorry d2 theta And if we want to add a phi Heliopoulos term, we can just add again an integral over d4 theta of the phi Heliopoulos term. OK. This is nice because uh, we are used to have the actions as, as integrals, and this is just precisely the integral on superspace. Interesting thing to note is that uh, there's a big difference between the Keller potential and the superpotential in the sense that the Keller potential you integrate over the whole superspace, whereas the superpotential you integrate only on, on half superspace. Okay. The same thing with W alpha, W alpha. So whenever you have um, holomorphic functions, you have the integral is only on, on half superspace, and the real part, you have the integral over the whole superspace. Okay, so, so to conclude, to conclude this, uh, this part, uh, <coughs> let me just write the most general. No, let me, sorry, let me just add uh, something which is non abelian generalization. <clears throat> um, in, that says, in that sense, e to the v prime equals e to the minus i lambda dagger e to the v e to the i lambda phi prime of course equals e to the minus i lambda that's phi but w alpha equals a bit more complicated minus one d bar d bar e to the minus 2v d alpha e to the 2v and in this case w prime, w prime alpha equals okay so this is uh, essentially just it's the same thing that we, we had for this uh, abelian case, we just <coughs> generalize it to the non-abelian case. This is, I'm just not writing for completeness, but not, uh, there's no, no, um, not much content into that because we are not going to use it just for completeness. And uh, the Lagrangian, when you write 
W alpha W alpha. This will have to be written as the trace of W alpha W alpha because now W is transform as a um, in terms of, uh, it, the, the, the W is transform uh, from the gauge uh, symmetry. Okay, so <clears throat> having that, so let me just write general Lagrangian, which is uh, uh, coupling gauge fields to matter fields in in uh, in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, n equals to one supersymmetry. And so, so most general action that is, first of all, the most general action will depend on uh, on four objects. Chi, which is a function of chiral fields e to the v and phi, and uh, it will depend also on the superpotential, which will be a function of all the phi i's, and then it will depend on the gauge kinetic function, which is a function of all the phi i's, only holomorphic, and on the so J. Leopoldus term, psi. Okay? So this is a, the action will be determined in a supersymmetric theory. You have to give these four things. This is a number, so it's not complicated. This is a holomorphic function, another holomorphic function, and a real function. Given these objects, you can construct the most general supersymmetric action for n equals to 1. And this will be equal to the integral <coughs> d4x d4 theta of k <coughs> plus xi v plus Integral d sorry d four x d two theta of uh, <coughs> w plus f w alpha w alpha plus Hermitian conjugate. Okay. Yes. So you could only include the Fayette Iliopolis term in U1. Exactly. Absolutely true. This only for U1 factors. So I haven't told you what the gauge group is. So the gauge group can be any product of uh, simple factors, SUN, cross SUN, so Only the U1 factors have a corresponding Fayette Iliopolis term. All the non abelian factors do not have Fajay Leopoldus term. <coughs> Thank you for that. And the reason is clear here because V, V itself transforms. Uh, like a, you know, in electromagnetism, the photon is chargeless, whereas the gluon is charged or, or the, the, the W bosons and so on. So the same thing here. So this, this will be the D term of V will be uh, chargeless. For a U1, for like electromagnetism, but it will be it will not be gauge invariant for a non-abelian group, and so that you cannot write this in your Lagrangian because the Lagrangian has to be gauge invariant. Excuse me. Yes. Are we not involving um, lambda Vegas in the uh, W transformation on the top row in the middle? You're saying W prime. Is, yes. Um, yeah. It's like this because remember that W is holomorphic. Uh, do, I'm sorry, W is chiral. So at the end, this, this thing has to be chiral also. <coughs> so why do we use chirality when involving lambda dagger? Precisely, because lambda dagger would be a function of phi dagger. And phi dagger is anti-chiral. Ah, okay. Yes, yes, good point. 
Yeah. So it 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 has to be it has to be something chiral at the end. Can psi be a valid sign? Either sign, yes. So there's an important thing when you are greater than or equal to naught when it's minus. Uh, well, no, because it's inside the square. Yes, exactly. But uh, yes, it, the important thing is the relative sign. It's away from phi equals zero. It's away from mod pi squared equals zero. Yes, when, yes. When q is when psi is negative. Exactly. But it's, it's, the important thing is the relative sign between psi and the because the charge can be negative also. Yes. yes. So the relative sign is important when you want to find solutions when, when the potential is zero. Then they have to they can they can cancel each other. Otherwise, you don't find solutions. Yeah. It's, uh, that's a very good point. OK, so this is the most general Lagrangian we can write. And, uh, and so we have it all. So we have all n equals to 1 supersymmetry, uh, uh, global supersymmetry coupling, all the fields that we are interested in, uh, matter fields and gauge uh, fields. Uh, what is it that we can do now? We can do uh, <coughs> something which is very strong, is to study uh, how these objects K, W, F, and Xi change under quantum corrections. That, that, that is the power of supersymmetry is that it is very well behaved under quantum corrections. We can just only get a bit of the surface of 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 of, uh, of the um, of of of, uh, of the power of these results. But I will try to give you a taste of what it is, and uh, and this refers to what is called the non-renormalization theorems. So the statement is since we know that uh, the whole Lagrangian will depend on Kera potential, super potential, gauge kinetic function, and the Faye Heliopoulos term, we have to see, we want to see how they um, behave under quantum corrections. So the question is how K, W, F, and Xi uh, behave under quantum corrections. Uh, <clears throat> I will just state uh, the result and a bit of the history, and uh, I will give you the proof next uh, uh, class, because we have only six minutes. But uh, let me just start with this. Uh, this, the claim is as follows. K gets corrections order by order. In perturbation theory. That's, that's the statement. So nothing surprising about K. Like any field theory, you get corrections order by order in perturbation theory. F. There's something very strong about F. F only gets corrections out one loop. It's only one loop corrected, and after one loop, no corrections. Okay, so that's. So you can do two loops, three loops, and so on. You know the, the loop expansion in, in field theory. Yes. So you can go to any, any order in perturbation theory, any loops. And from two on, f will not change. You have f at three level. You do the one loop correction. You can get the correction at one loop. And after that, there are no corrections. You get the exact result in perturbation theory. So this is very, very, very strong. At the, at the, basis of this result is that F is holomorphic. So holomorphicity plays the role 
and it, it makes a difference between F and K. K is non-holomorphic, it gets all corrections. F is holomorphic, and it's only corrected at one loop. W, which is also holomorphic, is not renormalized at any order in perturbation theory. So it's even stronger than this. So you give it a three, three level, that's it. That's your W. So the superpotential doesn't get any corrections in perturbation theory. Okay. So this is this is the strongest statement, and uh, well, similar to if we can say the same thing for phi also. But psi is just a number, so it's not a big deal. But the strongest statement I'm I'm making, and this is the one I'm, I will try to give you a taste of uh, of, of how it is proven uh, next time, uh, is is for W because this is the, one of the strongest results in in uh, supersymmetric theories is that uh, W, you give it a true level and doesn't get corrected. So you know that it's, it's exact to all orders in perturbation theory. It doesn't mean that it doesn't get corrected. It will get corrections, but the corrections will be non-perturbative. So it's only when you have to go to non-perturbative uh, quantum effects to get corrections to phi. But in perturbation theory, in perturbation theory, W of phi is exact. So there are no one loop, no two loops, no three loops, no any loops. Of perturbation theory corrects W, and uh, this is where we know the best about supersymmetric theories. And so, since I have just two minutes, so I'll just tell you the, the history a bit. And the history of this uh, this was in the 1970s, I think, 1970s. Um, in the 1970s, 1977. The work of uh, Grisaru and collaborators, Rochek and Siegel, they proved this result, in particular the non-normalization of the superpotential, by using a technique which is very uh, technical, mm -hmm. uh, which is called supergraphs. Supergraphs is that it's a generalization of Feynman diagrams for superfields. So you can have a Feynman diagram where the different uh, uh, lines and uh, legs and so on will not be just fields, but just whole superfields. So for that, they develop the people develop a whole industry of, of, of how how to define a supergraph, how to do calculations with supergraphs, and then using that, uh, this Grisaru, Rorschach, and Siegel, they were able to prove. <laughs> the non-normalization of the superpotential, for instance, in 1977. So some of you were not yet alive, I guess, but it's not that, <coughs> that far. Uh, however, the thing that we're going to use now, oh, I'm sorry, and, and the, the, the result that they found is that the quantum corrections, they say quantum corrections, only come as as corrections in your action which involve the full superspace and then you say well the superpotential is not in the full uh, integrated over the whole superspace and the gauge kinetic function is not the only exception is the one-loop correction, except the one-loop correction of F. Okay. So that's how they arrive at the result. They look for all quantum corrections, and all the corrections look like this. So reading the, 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 the Lagrangian, and, and uh, 
so, oh, sorry. <clears throat> okay, that was 1977. In 1993, you were still alive, or you were already alive. So, <clears throat> 1993, Cyberg came out with a nice set of arguments using just symmetries. It's based, important, based on a string theory arguments from Witten in 1985. Based on these arguments, Cyber was able to prove these results only using symmetry arguments and holomorphicity. And that is what we're going to do next time. So we'll start, I'll give you, for a simple model, I will pr prove you why W doesn't get renormalized by using cyber techniques, just 1993. So we're getting closer to, to today. So this is, this is a nice set of arguments, simple and very powerful. So I will try to give you a, a taste of what they are. Okay, so see you on Monday.